First, hello to everyone uh, from the United States where it's morning right now, so I can say good morning, even though I know it's not morning in India. I want to first thank the Foreign Policy Research Center and especially, especially to a man I admire greatly, its director and its guiding force and someone who I always, I, I read the stuff you send me all the time, and that's Professor Mahendra Gaur. I thank you so much. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about India-Israel relationships. And I'm probably going to say some things that are not quite expected. So let, let's, uh, let, let, let's uh, see what we can do. Um, I think the first thing we need to know is to truly understand the relationship between India and Israel today. We need to take a look at where it was not very long ago and look at the dynamics of that change. So, um, let me begin. I was in India in 2009 uh, doing my human rights work, and I want to be clear to people, my human rights work was not about India. My human, although later I've, I actually got involved with some things in, in West Bengal, but my focus is to stop the ethnic cleansing of Hindus in Bangladesh, which is, it, 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 it's, it's, it's bad, it, it's bad. And I, but at that time in 2009, that was a period when the Bangladeshi government refused to let me in the country because of that work. I, I, I go there freely now. So India became my base for operations, initiatives, and, and uh, actions that I took. Anyway, so this was 2009. While I was there, there was a group of attorneys from the, who practiced at the Supreme Court who approached me and asked if I would speak to their group on, ready, Jewish-India relations. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what that meant, but when I, uh, but of course I, I eagerly accepted, and I, when I entered, I wasn't sure what it meant, when I entered the chamber, all my questions were answered, because on the podium, behind the podium was a large banner that announced my presence, and also the title of my talk. And what was it? Jews and Jihad, what can India learn? That was the, that was the uh, title. I, I didn't know that it was the title until then, but that was very interesting. Okay. Um, so, what the, I, 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 later I asked them about the idea behind them, you know, the, the, the talk. And, they, and basically, this was the idea. Here we have a tiny, tiny country of Israel with a population that was about the same as Hyderabad, not even, your, not even one of your three largest cities. And Israel had stopped radical terrorism, had defeated it. On the other hand, you have India, not the size of a city, but the second largest country in the entire planet. And we know that Within the next couple decades, India will become the largest country on the planet that at that time was having a very difficult uh, time with radical terrorism. In fact, every time I was in India, I tell people there, 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 were, there were terrorist attacks. Uh, some were by Naxalites and some were by uh, ra radical uh, jihadists, but always terror. And India couldn't seem to get find a way to get over it. But, Anyhow, so that was a thought. So I thought the very, the very uh, basis of the um, talk, and I'm, by the way, because of my American accent, I'm trying to speak a little slowly or to repeat things. So if anyone can't understand, uh, maybe afterwards you, you can ask me to clarify. Anyway, but I found, I found the, uh, the request telling in several ways. First of all, they wanted to know about Israel. Well, I'm not Israeli. I'm an American, but people, especially back then, but even now to some extent, conflate being Jewish with being Israeli. And, and not only is that, I mean, that's conceptually flawed. Um, in fact, Jews have positions on Israel that range all over. Um, and at that time, in fact, a minority of Jews, only 40% of all world, Jew, world Jewry, lived in Israel. Um, more were like me, they were like, they were American Jews like me. Although today, uh, more Jews live in, in Israel than anywhere else. Anyhow, but even so, and this is another thing about what it was like back then. 
even so, for most of the people there, this was about as close. I was about as close as they were going to come to meeting an Israeli. So I guess I was some kind of prize. Uh, third, I, I believe back then, and I still believe that in making that request, the lawyers made a very bold move because even giving Israel a, a big platform back then could be dangerous. I, I can tell you that it was very common for the UPA government to warn or even threaten my associates there and, and uh, harass them uh, after I left. I, I got a, the UPA government did not have the stones, did not have the chops to d confront me directly. They would go after um, my associates. The other thing in 2009, talking about Israel and India, uh, terrorism was a real, uh, a, a real concern. So I, I have to give credit to the uh, uh, to, to the attorneys uh, of, who practiced the Supreme Court for what they did. Anyway, it, it there was also something else. Although, like I said, terrorism was a um, was a concern. It wasn't just terrorism, because in fact, several times that day, people tried to disrupt the proceedings, and it wasn't the first time for me. I've been picketed by uh, Ira Iranian uh, students and others and by uh, radical leftists at JNU. And uh, so it wasn't a problem for me, but I thought what happened was very interesting. When they tried to disrupt it, at first, my Indian colleagues sat silently and very embarrassed, very embarrassed by what was happening. So I was one that stood up and told those disruptors why they had to sit down and shut up and why they were wrong. But you know, eventually, I didn't have to say anything because my Indian colleagues were the ones who stood up and let them know that what they were doing was not acceptable. Well, you know, once the disruptors uh, saw that, and these people were all working against an Indian for a relationship, once they saw that, they knew the game was over. They knew, and after the Indian people, not me, but after the Indian academics did what they did, those disruptors walked out tails between their legs because they knew that they were defeated. At which point I said, well, you wanted to know what can India do? There's your first lesson. Be strong so you can defeat people who think they can shout down freedom and democracy. Anyway, that seemed to be a uh, microcosm to me at the time. India was going through a period of introspection about this relationship, uh, although it wasn't reflected in the 2009 polls, obviously. Um, there was, there was a lot of introspective, and, and particularly about uh, India was having trouble with local bullies, if you know what I mean, people in the in the area. And at that time, you'll remember, uh, really didn't know quite what to do with it. But Israel seemed to offer a way out of India's, at that time, weak international position. Later that year, by the way, uh, the Indian government quietly asked the Israeli government for help after the 2611 terror attack to Mumbai. And uh, I, I knew one of the Israelis who was there, and he told me, he said, they weren't allowed to wear uniforms or any insignia that identified them as, as Israeli. They were told, do your intelligence work, do your work, get it done, but do it low key. Don't want to, they don't want to make a big thing about Israel being in India. Do it low key. And, and by the way, you're not going to see much about this in the in, in the uh, media, press. But of course, uh, we now know that Israel was instrumental in helping India uh, get to the bottom of uh, who was behind the uh, 2611 attacks, and and gave and still gives India really good intelligence in the area. Anyway, but back then I used to like it, and you'll know, please excuse me if this is problematic for anyone, but I always felt that the simile fits. I used to liken the Indian's attitude towards that of a married man and his mistress. You know, when they were together, sex was great. It was a great relation. They, 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 they loved it. But both of them also worked overtime to make sure no one found out about it. Okay, we're going to be together. We're going to do this, but let's not tell anyone about it. Um, and. That was what it was like back then, if you were uh, involved in the India-Israel relationship. But that's all changed now, hasn't it? And the uh, India-Israel relationship is one of the most important 
bilateral relationships on the planet. Excuse me. Excuse me. Now, there's no point in reviewing the very impressive statistics that have come with that war that warming of the relationship. The ongoing and sizable cooperation in defense and intelligence and counterterrorism, business development, the cyber ventures that India and Israel have together, water management uh, and, and green energy. Uh, we, we know about that. We also know how Israel has become one of the top uh, defense suppliers for India. But I mentioned water management. I want to tell you, give you another story, tell you another story. Uh, the first time I met Prime Minister Narendra Modi, um, he, was, uh, he was still chief minister at the, in Gujarat at the time. And in 2009, he had already brought drip irrigation to Gujarat. What's drip, drip irrigation? It's, in a, it's the Israeli technology that Israel has used to make the deserts bloom, to, to have uh, tremendously uh, fertile farmland, uh, even in deserts. And, and by the way, uh, you know, when, the, when Israel still had, uh, was in Gaza, even before the withdrawal, uh, it had uh, hothouse tomatoes that were grown in sand under drip irrigation. And the American Jewish community bought them, gave them to the, uh, to the Palestinians who were going to uh, be living there. And uh, what the uh, Palestinians uh, did, they completely destroyed them. And so now... And so he didn't have the benefit of that. But in any event, back then, he had already brought Israeli technology to Gujarat. Oh, also, uh, when, uh, when, I, when I was uh, leaving his office and we were shaking hands, that part, he, 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 he said to me, and I remember his exact, his exact word, he said, I will do any joint venture with Israel, which, uh, which he did. And uh, of course, all these things, contribute to what I remember happening uh, when, uh, Prime Minister, when Prime Minister first ran uh, as the head of his party and, and first uh, won. Uh, so many people I remember in places outside of Gujarat were saying they were voting for Mr. Modi because they wanted him to do for all of India what you did for Gujarat. And a lot of that was based on his warm relations with Israel and the technology brought. So anyway, it's true that India and Israel, formal, uh, India formally recognized India in 1950, which by the way was two years after India came into being. But as yes, Prime Minister Nehru said at the time, because, it, I'm doing it because Israel is a fact and we have to recognize it. That was in 1950, but nothing really happened until then. It wasn't until 1991 that India uh, upgraded its relations with Israel and the two countries exchanged open embassies and exchanged ambassadors. Um, and by the way, just to mention something that I remember uh, being in the ambassador, the uh, embassy, embassy section in, in uh, New Delhi, I would go there many times. And uh, I remember in addition to the Israeli embassy, India was one of the few countries that had a uh, an embassy, it's an embassy of the state of Palestine, even of course there's no such thing as a state of Palestine. Uh, but that was part of the balancing act that India always had to maintain. And by the way, in saying what I'm saying, don't think for a moment that I don't recognize the difficult job that India has balancing these relationships. Anyways, that was 1991, but it, we know it really took off with, uh, the, with the administration of Narendra Modi. Now, a lot's been made about the personal relationship between uh, Prime Minister Modi and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, and that was very real. But even beyond that, there were so many reasons. And by the way, for those who, uh, who, who uh, wonder about the relationship, uh, just today, I believe it was, the chairperson for the ruling coalition resigned. That means that the ruling coalition no longer has a majority, and if they can't figure out a way to get one, there's going to be new elections. And, and uh, uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu's popularity has increased a, a great deal. And uh, if there's new elections, he's going to run again. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but even beside that that relationship, uh, there there's so many 
reasons for India and Israel to be friends. Both nations represent cultures and religion. This go back thousands of years, far, far longer than any of the other uh, religions that dominate uh, our planet today. And these religions and these cultures have made significant contributions to humanity. India was doing, the, the uh, Indian uh, and, and, and Hindus they were doing things at a time, tremendously at a time when people in Europe were still wearing animal skins. Um, so, you know, both, they have this commonality of these ancient cultures, and we actually ran a program here uh, entitled Ancient Cultures, Modern Miracles, which showed how both uh, fit into those, those categories. Anyway, other thing, both India and Israel live in very dangerous neighborhoods, and they face continual attacks designed to, and these people are very clear about what they want to erase them as they are. I, I, always, I always say that the Kashmir, Kashmir is like, it, it, I call it India's West Bank. Why? Because the anti-India activists, that, oh, all they want is justice in Kashmir. All they want is Kashmir, 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 Kashmir. But same thing. The anti-Israel activists say, no, we just want to stay on the West Bank. But uh, we know that uh, if, we, if we dig a little deeper, we find that both Kashmir and uh, the West Bank represent incremental advances that are made uh, at the expense of, uh, of, of Indian and Israel. And I want to mention one other thing, just to put a little uh, exclamation point on that. Uh, for those who believe that all the Palestinians want is a state on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, let me remind you that up until 1967, they could have had one. Israel had nothing to do with Gaza, West Bank, or East Jerusalem. They were under Jordanian occupation. But you know what? The Palestinians never even asked for a state. Instead, they sent Mujahideen terrorists into Israel and claimed that Israel had to be wiped off the map. So uh, nothing really changed. So I want to emphasize, by the way, that in, when I talk about India and Israel in this context, I'm talking about external actors. Uh, you know, both countries have their problems with certain elements of the population, uh, but for both those populations increasingly recognize their membership in the nation and in a greater polity, uh, and, and that it's in their own and their children's well-being. Uh, but India has Pakistan, Israel has Iran. It's reality. Anyway, the only way that both nations survive, the only way, I don't care whatever else, whatever anyone else says. The only way both nations survive is to be smarter and stronger than their enemies. So Israel and India share that, and uh, they, you know, they 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 share a lot of pushback in in the in the in getting there. And as I personal note, as as someone who's travel who travels a lot, at least pre pandemic. Uh, and has been to a lot of places in the world. I can tell you that for both India and Israel, and I'm not counting the United States, because I don't travel to the United States, I live here. In both India and Israel, I can tell you, when you step on that land for the first time, you know you're in a special place. You know you're somewhere where you are going to you are going to gain something and learn something and be with something that's not like anywhere else in the world. India and Israel share that. I haven't found that anywhere else that I've traveled. So again, that's a yeah, uh, that's just like a personal note. But I think several things changed that enabled the Israel-India relationship to blossom. Um, and let me start with the first, which. Had, get, had to be gotten out of the way. Initially, both countries, India and Israel, even more so India, but India and Israel both initially, I believe, looked to Western Europe as a reference, even though both countries had to struggle to free themselves from West European colonialism. But I think both countries did, did look uh, to Western Europe. And in fact, uh, until the uh, 1970s, uh, largest uh, arms suppliers Arms supplier for Israel came from uh, from, from uh, Europe, and of course we know that uh, largest arms supplier for decades in India was, was Russia, which is a European country. So, but both countries, though not Western, both countries looked to Western, and that changed. That changed because they 
they, 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 they uh, eventually both countries showed the what I call the soft socialism uh, of, of Western Europe, and in fact, the political uh, the, the political atmosphere which denigrates uh, both countries' attempts to uh, maintain their independence. So that changed, and and they did this. Well, you know, I, you know, by the way, I, I can tell you about Israel. Honey. Western Europe continues to uh, to uh, wag their fingers at Israel as being problematic, but at the same time, I can tell you that they're while they're wagging their fingers and talking about Israel this and Israel that, they're happily doing a tremendous amount of business with Israel and very, very happily, accept, happily accepting its military intelligence cooperation. So anyway, all that changed. Because we know that India and Israel both had that problem. So, so the reality of the security situations in both countries, I think also dawned on the people. Um, I believe my own experience with both Indians and Israelis is both people have a good heart and want to do right by all the peoples in their area. But I think, you know, at a certain point, they recognize their security situation and recognize that they can't, they can't, be, they can't, they, they, not everyone's going to play ball nicely with them. This meant that both electorates in both countries grew more conservative and focused on the importance of a strong deterrence. Uh, we have an old saying, if the Arabs put down their guns, there'd be no more war. If the Israelis put down their guns, there'd be no more Israel. In other words, a recognition that you have to remain strong. So instead of the Indian Congress Party in India and the Labor Party in Israel, both of which dominated these countries for decades, we have BJP in India. And until a couple of years ago, the uh, you know, Likud in Israel, and as I said a few minutes ago, we might see Likud again. And even though Likud is, is uh, in the opposition, has most seats in the parliament, and um, the ruling government is not labor anymore. It's a conservative coalition. So again, both electorates became more conservative. When we become more conservative, you start seeing that you have to focus on your security situation. Anyway, there's no point in reviewing the impressive statistics that have come with this relationship, uh, the ongoing and sizable cooperation in defense, intelligence, and counterterrorism. Tremendous business development, which by the way, is reflected in additional business development between Hindus and Jews and, and the countries they, they, they are reflect here in the United States. Um, cyber ventures, and we know both countries have tremendous capacities in, cy in the cyber world that others don't. Uh, a water management, uh, green energy, and, and more. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned about, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I was at the wrong place, excuse me. Anyhow, so by, I, I want to pivot. Like I said, I don't want to focus on, on, on what we all know and what we could get through any Google search. That's not what's important. And that's not why you have me here. You can do a Google, Google search yourself. But I want to pivot to what I believe is the most important geopolitical change that happened that, affect, uh, that affected this relationship. And that is that the decoupling, decoupling of the Arab-Israeli conflict from religion. That is so critical. I can't even begin to talk about how important that is. We know that for the longest time, the Arab-Israeli conflict was uh, postured as a conflict between the Muslims and the Jews, and that's what it was. And if you were a good Muslim, you had to be on the side of the Arabs, and if you were a good Jew, you had to be on the side of Israel. And that has changed, I think. That has enabled so much to happen. Um, and let me mention, I, you know, I hear a lot of things being said about your first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. And whatever anyone wants to say about him, they can say, that's fine. But with regard to this, a lot of people have said the reason Nehru recognized Israel in 1950, but didn't really have relations with it, was because he, he was an anti-Semite, he didn't like Jews. Uh, some people say, oh, it's because he was a communist. 
Uh, they say, well, yeah, because he was a crypto Muslim or whatever you want to call it, something like that. Um, and still others said it was because he wanted to steer India on a clearly non-aligned course. And Israel was, of course, favored by the U.S., while the USSR favored the Arabs. So, you know, there were all these reasons that people said uh, that Nehru uh, did not, uh, you know, develop a, a good relation, a warm relation with Israel. But I don't think any of them were it. You know, there might have been something to the non-aligned movement, although, remember, one of his big partners in the non-aligned movement was uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was Israel's implacable enemy. So it was like, he was like Israel's Iran back in the day. Anyhow, so I don't think that's all of it. I think what really prevented Nehru and the other prime ministers from developing that warm relationship is because they are the prime minister of all people in India. They're not just the prime minister of Hindus or Christians or anyone else in particular, but of all Indians. And as long as the Arab-Israeli conflict was set in terms of a religious conflict, they would have a difficult time being so openly warm to Israel. They would alienate a significant part of the population who they were elected to serve. So I think, you know, you put that with the, what I call the soft socialism of Western Europe that Congress tended to look at, and a number of other things that uh, individuals can can uh, can, can uh, bring up themselves. I think that was the major factor that prevented warm relations between India and Israel. And by the way, I do want to be clear. Not for a moment do I want anyone to think that I'm saying, oh, you know, it's those bad Muslims, and or there was a problem where Jews and Muslims are and can't. Get. Absolutely not. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that that was a reality. And Muslims throughout the world were victimized more. And that's why I said this, I believe, is the most important geopolitical change. This is no longer seen as a religious uh, conflict. Because if you remember back then, the conflict was always explained in religious terms that, well, you know, the land had been Islamic, uh, it must remain Islamic. Or, you know, the, the Israeli Israelis cannot have control over Al-Aqsa. Or we have a duty to, to assist all other Muslims, whatever, you know, you might be. In fact, back then, the only Muslim country with relations, who had relations with Israel was Turkey. But that's the way the conflict was, was, uh, was set. And so I think it would be the duty of Muslims in India to use their legal political power to object if India embraced a country they considered an enemy. So that was a big, big problem, not just for India, but certainly we're talking about India. So, um, and during this period, there was no break in the solid Arab slash Muslim front it was a, con the conflict was religious, it was Jews versus Muslim. And I can tell you, in the many years I come, I've come to India, I, you know, I've, I've been picketed, I, I remember being picketed in, in, uh, in JNU, and, they were, and, and what the picketers were saying was that, uh, I, I came with a, uh, a good friend of mine, was saying, aha, here we have Hindu Twa and Zionism teaming up for evil purposes. I was picketed by by uh, by Iran and Iranian students in in, in in Bangladesh. I've been picked many. So again, it was always a religious thing, um, and even the peace treaties Israel signed between uh, Egypt and with Egypt and Jordan didn't really change. And they were they were always called a cold peace. You know, um, Egypt did it in part because uh, Anwar Sadat was smart enough to realize that by um, Teaming up with uh, with uh, with, uh, with Nasser, it wasn't really. I mean, with uh, the USSR, it wasn't really helping his people. Uh, by the way, uh, Professor Gore, uh, am I going over my time? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. Uh, no time limit. No time limit. 
All right, well, I'll try and make sure people can ask questions. Uh, sorry. Anyway, and but Amr Zadat was smart enough to realize he needed to do better for his people. And so he, I, I, he actually, besides Israel, he approached the United States. And as a result of the peace treaty and the agreement between Israel and Egypt, Israel got back the Sinai Peninsula. And overnight, it became the second largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid. Okay, as well as not having to shed Egyptian blood and treasure in feudal wars against Israel that always ended up in disaster for, for Egypt. Jordan, what they got in return was security cooperation with both Israel and the U.S. And I don't think people hear how important that is. But of course, we know things have changed since then. Um, we no longer think of this as purely a, a, um, a religious conflict. I remember back in 2017, I was uh, having discussions with a uh, Muslim government uh, about, uh, about Israel. And one of the things I was saying to them was this very, very thing that for a long time, I appreciated that a Muslim majority nation was obligated to maintain that solid front and even put the best interests of its own people second to the interests of Palestinians or Arab solidarity, or whatever you want to say. But of course, that had changed. Um, I, I remember in some of my discussions with them, uh, I, I know I noted that uh, back in 2015, there were 44 Muslim majority countries with at least 1 million people. And by 2015, 18 of them currently had, I mean, 18 of them had full, full diplomatic ties with Israel. And all but eight had some kind of quiet cooperation or business relations, uh, some really going up uh, in, into government and, and, uh, and media. And in fact, it's gotten even better since then. Many Muslim majority nations have made peace with Israel, have developed relations. We all know about the Abraham Accords um, that uh, it by, in, it un, under which the uh, uh, Gulf states of the UAE and Bahrain, along with Sudan and later Morocco in addition, all have developed relations with India. And I can tell you, I followed them closely. These are nothing like the cold peace that Israel had with Egypt and Jordan. And by the way, Egypt's relations with uh, the people in both countries, and especially Egypt, ha has grown tremendously. Um, but the, the amount of, uh, of interaction, of business development that Israel and these countries have is tremendous. And, you know, other Muslim majority countries have joined too. And uh, we still have those eight holdouts, but we'll see. Some of them are teetering. Um, so again, it's no longer a religious conflict. India can embrace. Israel without alienating its substantial Muslim population, without its substantial Muslim population feeling that they're obliged to take an anti-Israel position. That has changed. And I think, and this is really separate, I think over the many years I've come to India, many, many Indians have told me that Indian Muslims aren't like Muslims in, in many other countries. And there's a, there, Sure, I'm not saying that everything is oh so beautiful and wonderful. You know, like any other country, including mine, the United States, you have your internal uh, issues to deal with. However, they've told me that the relation that most Indian Muslims really see themselves as Indians, as part of the same polity. So anyway, they didn't feel that they had to become, uh, uh, you know, anti. So I want to say one, one another thing. Um, in terms of putting your people's interest, their people's interest second. So, this, again, many years ago, I, uh, I was teaching uh, at a college in, in Chicago. And uh, after teaching, I got on the subway to go back home. And one of my students got on the subway with me and, and told me a story. He's a Muslim, and he was from the African nation of, of uh, the Gambia. And what he told me was, in 1973, because of this religious setting, this country had to cut all ties with Israel. He said, that was horrible for us. His village and, and, and all the ones around had Israelis in there helping 
helping develop their agriculture and their water resources and things like that. And overnight, they all had to go. But again, now they, these, these countries can feel, as India can feel, can feel it's okay for them to put their own interests first. Um, okay, let me try and go real fast. Um, we also saw, by the way, that during the recent Hamas war against Israel, they tried to make it a religious conflict. Remember, they talked about Jerusalem, but with the exception of the most radical uh, entities and states, like uh, entities like the Palestinians or uh, uh, Hezbollah, uh, states like Iran, uh, only the most radical bought that religious uh, narrative. In fact, many Arab countries uh, pushed back on it very, very hard. And the Saudis, in fact, uh, really took the Palestinians to task, uh, waved their finger at them and said, look, you either you, you have to stop holding to these ridiculous demands and not negotiating, or just go away from the table and forget about it. They also in there was forget about aid from us. So, so I think there are a couple other things we want to talk about, and I'll try and be quick. India and Israel both underwent a significant change in their approach to geopolitics over the last several years, and it was reflected by the two prime ministers who took power at that time and helped lead their countries on this course. And what was that course? Both countries realized that to make it in the world, they had to have good relations with other countries. Absolutely. They had to develop their relations. And we know excuse <coughs> me, that both the prime ministers of both countries were working very hard to make sure those relationships serve the interests of their people as well. We knew that, but both countries also realized that they had to chart an independent course. India, and you'll forgive me, this is, <coughs> pardon me, this is not, <coughs> pardon me, this is not, an insult to India by any means. It's more of an insult to the West, but it's deserved. I would tell people for years, I would tell people in governments in the West here, that you have to stop treating India like it, like it's your pet. India is a great nation, an independent nation, and we have to recognize that. Well, that was part of what India had to do, which I think it's been doing very well. I think the next step is, uh, we hope that one day India gets a permanent seat on the Security Council, certainly deserves it. And perhaps with all the talk about Russia right now uh, and about how it's, it's violating the tenets of the United Nations, that uh, perhaps will be an opening. So, but anyway, India had to chart an independent course, which it has. I think the world realizes that. No one's treating India like a pet anymore. If they do, they're going to get their hands bitten. Israel also, although Israel was solidly, has been solidly allied with the United States, U.S. and Israel are the, are the strongest allies strongest allies, and both people of both countries recognize that their greatest friends are each other. And as I said, as far as you know, Jews go, uh, outside, you know, between Israel and the United States, 85% of all Jews live in those two countries. And it, it, it's, uh, that percentage is actually growing. So, uh, to, however, and this really started during the Obama administration, when the U.S. administration was not quite as supportive of Israel as, as uh, than expected. The Israeli government realized that, uh, and it's really Netanyahu, uh, that uh, they had to also uh, develop an independent course and develop strong relations with Russia. Because I don't know if you know, there are many, many uh, Jewish immigrants from Russia, and there's a whole, there's a major political party in Israel uh, called uh, called Israel Betenu, which means Israel at home, that's uh, for uh, Russian Jews. So they developed excellent relations with Russia. And uh, they also have developed great relations with China. So, uh, and in fact, as far as uh, that independent course, those independent courses, that's why if you look at things closely during this Ukrainian war, both India and Israel have taken criticism at times for not being so effusively, so effusively conde condemning Russia. And I think. In governments, people realize, look, there, there are very practical reasons for that. Israel and Russia have an agreement where they're both flying combat sorties over Lebanon and Syria, and they both work very hard. They want to make sure there's no mistakes that they end up shooting at each other. 
And so they have a great deal of security cooperation for that area. We know for India, Russia for, for decades was made with its top arm supporter and still is a major arm support, even though its percentage keeps declining. Um, India has just purchased a ton, uh, just a bunch of Russian oil, which India needs to fuel its economy. And by the way, if we're going to criticize India for that, we should criticize Western Europe for still buying Russian oil. Anyhow, so both countries have taken some criticism, although I, I, I am glad to see that both countries unequivocally, without any, without any, any, any equivocation, have condemned Russia severely for what we now know are crimes against humanity that were, com com that were committed by the Russians in Bucha, Ukraine. Uh, so uh, good for them. So and my point is both countries are, you know, both countries have a very delicate geopolitical situation. And I think the only country that truly understands what that is, is, is the other. So I think there's a tremendous bond. Obviously, it outlasted the, uh, the, the tenure of, of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Hopefully that means, because you know, one day India, uh, Narendra Modi will not be Prime Minister of India, whatever day that is. Hopefully this relationship will outlast his tenure as well. So I think that, you know, there, there are some really good structural uh, reasons. The other thing uh, we, we uh, want to know uh, about is, uh, again, both are also reorienting their national policy or national profile and really are running away from uh, from, from uh, the, the uh, sort of uh, the soft socialism, leftism that, that, that we saw. Um, I think uh, although India will always, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think India will always support Palestinian rights. And, you know, it goes back to uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, recognized uh, some, some sympathy for Palestinians. However, at the same time, I think Indian leaders have recognized that's a, that's a dead end for their people. They can keep that, uh, they can continue uh, being supportive. But, you know, if you go back to like how the Saudis reacted, to the Palestinians after the Hamas war or during the Hamas war, um, we see that uh, a much, much more productive, productive approach for the people of India. We're talking about the people of India, all of you, all, not not for some political principle, but for the well-being of the principle of, uh, people of India. They have to chart this independence course. Um, and again, that's why both countries are U.S. allies, but both countries also have uh, good relations with the countries that the U.S. doesn't like. So, uh, again, I, I really uh, rush through this. I, I, uh, I see, um, but uh, I, I see that the time. But um, another example of the change. As I said, uh, in 1950, uh, India recognized Israel. The first Indian uh, leader did not come to Israel until 2015. No, pure, I mean, that was not even your prime minister. That was uh, President Mukherjee. This was very interesting to me, because if you remember that visit, she went to Israel, and that was very historic. At the same time, after that, she went to Syria and stood next to Bashir Assad, and said the Golan Heights must be returned to Syria. That shows the difficulty of the relationship uh, between the two countries. And I, I will tell you this, I know people who, have, who, who are knowledgeable who have been able to tell me that Israel is well aware of this. That's why even after the warming of that relationship and very public warming of that relationship, Israel recognized that in the first few votes, India first voted against Israel, then a couple, we're talking about the UN, I'm sorry, UN voted in the first order against Israel and abstained a few times before actually voting in favor of the Israeli position. So they're both in a very, very difficult situation as they both try to chart their independent course geopolitically. Um, the other factor that we're going to have to watch because it, is that, of course, the current war in the Ukraine uh, we, we, uh, we, we have to be 
pain, right? a tremendous loss of life, destruction of cities and infrastructure, the war crimes. And, and by the way, that's primarily, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the Ukrainians, but we're also seeing uh, neighboring countries like Poland and, and Romania, Moldova, uh, flooded with refugees. I know uh, uh, the, the mayor of Warsaw just said that they can't handle anymore. And of course, we know there have been many, many more than 10,000, 10,000, many more than 10,000 Russian to have been killed. We're seeing a great lot, but beyond all that, the fact is, and some people might not like me to say this, this war is not about that. This war is about an attempt to reconstitute a international world order that is independent of the United States. That's why we saw the United States through Russia off of uh, the SWIFT banking system, and we know that Russia and China have a new system that they've developed, and they're getting some small countries, especially, by the way, countries like uh, that that are uh, uh, that 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 are owe a lot of money to China through Belt and Road, like Bangladesh, for instance, uh, or Maldives. Uh, you know, but so this is about realigning the world order. Now, so far, from the point of view of an American, I'm grateful that uh, this is not going very well. Um, but there will be. You know, the, but that's it. And, and as this is happening, I really see a very, very, very important element being you know, uh, Israel, India, being able to chart that independent course where they're maintaining good relations with both sides, but taking care of their own people first and dealing with the bad actors in their neighborhood. One final thing. Whatever statistics you can see right now, you see right now, expect them to, about business development, expect them to grow. I know many things are in the works right now. Um, I know there are many technologies that Israel has that India can use. Uh, there are many, there, there, there are many technologies and products that India has that Israel's using. Not long ago, I helped arrange a trip of uh, a, a young Hindu from India, and I say Hindu because he's a, a Hindu activist, uh, not RSS, but a Hindu activist. I helped arrange a trip for him to uh, Samaria, which is the northern part of what you might call the West Bank. Uh, and during that time, he was welcomed warmly, and both sides started working on business development. So there's an entire new area, which by the way, while, and here's another opportunity for, for India, by the way, while Europe is starting to back away from doing business with the uh, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, or what is called the West Bank, uh, India doesn't have to. That's a tremendous amount of business opportunities that are open. Now, as I said, the whole uh, screed against uh, doing anything of like that really is becoming a dead end, even for many of the Arabs. So I think whatever we're seeing today, between India and Israel, we can expect this to grow and blossom, hopefully to, and, and I believe that, that will survive the prime ministerships of, of both ben, ben, Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Narendra Modi, although I think we have to thank both of those men for really kickstarting and for having the courage to really kickstart that relationship. Thank you very much. Um, if we have time, I'd love to take questions. Uh, 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 Richard, uh, you have explained everything very uh, deeply from all aspects, whether it is political, economic, and uh, uh, geopolitical, uh, all aspects of bilateral relationship have been uh, explained in detail by you, and uh, they hardly leave a, I mean, any questions to be answered. But even then, I will ask my students to, if they have any queries, uh, they can uh, uh, ask you a question. Yes, please uh, ask the questions. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yes. First of all, thank you for the title. Uh, hi. Hi, so, Hi. Hi, Manishka. I'm a final year mass media student from uh, a college in Mumbai. And uh, I, first of all, thank you for such insightful session. This was really, really interesting. And uh, I had just a question uh, like, uh, 
So recently, a uh, a UN, uh, UN Human Rights Council report has uh, said that what Israel is doing in Palestine is sort is like apartheid. So. Uh, well yeah, I, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Could you repeat? Could you repeat that question? I want to be very clear on what you asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm asking: Is a recent uh, UN Human Rights Human Rights Council report has accused Israel of apartheid in Palestine? Okay. So at that time, when a international organization like UN is uh, accusing a country like Israel of such violation. How can we expect uh, India, like you stated, to embrace? And I'm quoting you. I'm sorry if I misquote you. To embrace Israel without taking, without alienating Muslims of Israel. So that's my question to you. Okay, I think that's that's a good question. And uh, if you will excuse my language, I'll say the answer. The first answer to that is, what comes from the human right, UN Human Rights Council is total bullshit. They are. They, they, and they have, li they have no credibility. I can tell you this. Uh, and when you think about a human rights council that has Russia as one of its one, one of its board members, that that tells you a lot about human rights. It has had human rights violators up and down the the map. So it has no credibility. Human rights council is is uh, the majority is formed by human rights violators, and that's why you know the United States for a while. Uh, left that council and i think we'll see more of that unless the human rights council um you know uh, mends its way all we, what we want is truth and objectivity which the human rights council doesn't have and so my response to you is you know whatever comes out of the mouth of the human rights council is worthless and if and 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 i can tell you that uh, the government of india has not uh, has, has has not taken what they've said seriously nor has any other government where I can tell you that any government that has taken uh, any action has not said, well, you know, the UN Human Rights Council, blah, 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 never did, never did. By the way, one other thing, I want to get back to that religious conflict, but it is very telling because I think that's what the Human Rights Council would like because, again, you have a really strong block that will always be anti-Israel if, if you go back to the past. But the Human Rights Council has taken a large number of very important Jewish, Jewish religious and historical uh, sites in Israel and has said, no, they're not Jewish, they're just for Muslims. You see, it's bias, it's just bias. So I guess my, my answer to you is, how do I expect? I expect that the government of India and the people of India are smart enough to recognize bias and again, excuse my language, are, are smart enough to smell bullshit. Um, by the way, yeah. that hasn't resulted in, in any uh, any actions brought before the uh, uh, the the, uh, the the to take specific actions uh, brought before the uh, the the uh, Security Council. There've been other things, but never but never never said, oh, you know, the Human Rights Council says blah blah, because even they know. There's no credibility to what the Human Rights Council says. And by the way, just to give you one other thing, I'm very close with a couple of people who are uh, who are the heads of NGOs that uh, are that are in Geneva for all the Human Rights Council meetings, and they'll tell you the same thing. And they're not all Jewish, by the way. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, next question. Yes. Good evening, sir. Namaskar. First of all, thank you so much for such a great session with so many primary observations from your past experiences. So my question is, in today's world where uh, so many people empathize with and recognize the minority rights in the world, why is that uh, so very less people are aware of anti-Hinduism or empathize with Hindu minorities in the world? Wow. Well, I would, I'll, I'm going to tell Professor Gore, I would love to have a, uh, a session focus on that and my work in Bangladesh, uh, because it, I, you know that's a that's a huge issue and it's an issue so close to my heart. Because this is what I've devoted a good part of my life to. Uh, so this really isn't the appropriate form. I I would love to do it, but I will say just very briefly, uh, I would say there are two. 
Okay, they're, they're two, I mean, remember this is very general. One is anti-Hindu bias, and I can I can be very detailed in explaining that again, just not here. And two, I think the Hindu community and uh, nations like India have not been aggressive enough in pushing this. I think those two things uh, would make a huge, huge difference. Those two things make a huge difference. But again, let's save that for another day. And and by the way, Professor Gar, I want to mention, in addition to offering, uh, you know, to do a, a session on that with your students, uh, just before the pandemic, I had a month long um, residency in Assam. Uh, it was with a an NGO, but it was uh, also with the Assam University and another college there. And I would like you to know that if at some point after the pandemic allows us, uh, you know, that I could uh, spend some time uh, in a residency in in India, I'd be more than happy to uh, to do that. I I not only love the country of India, the people of India. But I must tell you, I have a very, very special place in my heart for the students in India who I've met, who I've met, when I've worked with, who I've known. Not all of them believe the way I do, by the way, and that's great. That's great. We never want people to always believe the same thing. We want there to be discussion and conflict like that. But I have a very special place in my heart for the students and young people of India and would be very, very happy to give a month of myself if the opportunity ever presents itself. So. That is just my comment to Professor Gower. Yeah, no, no, we are going to provide you another opportunity, don't worry, <laughs> near future. I mean, uh, I'm always on the lookout uh, for such distinguished people to express their opinion, to clarify things. There are many misconceptions about many things. So we pick up people, I mean, uh, distinguished people to clarify things, to explain things in detail so that if there is any uh, misunderstanding about that issue or concept or whatever it is, so it is clarified. So uh, any more questions? So there is a question in the chat box. Uh, this is from Akhilesh Tivedi. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the question goes, what will be the impact on India's key defense relationships with strategic partners like Israel? In where, where I think that's going in the future? Well, what we're seeing are, are several different trends. We know that for decades, India's major arms supply was Russia. But that percentage has been going down tremendously year after year after year over the last several years. And I think that's smart. I think number one, and by the way, this is what I'm going to say now, this applies to everything that comes afterwards, not just Russia. India, very smartly, has recognized that it cannot be too dependent on any one country. <laughs> of course it can, and it shouldn't be. It's a great country in and of itself. And that's the other part of it. India has developed a uh, really vibrant and, and successful internal arms program. And that's great. I mean, it's all part of, uh, you know, it's all, it fits nicely with uh, Narendra Modi's Make in India concept. Uh, but, of course, when arms are made in India instead of imported from another country, the people that make them, the people that have the jobs, are Indian. The people that own these stores where those employees shop with the money they've earned are Indian. And it's, it infuses the Indian economy tremendously more than any uh, import. So that's one thing. We know that the Indian arms industry is growing. So we know that imports will continue to fall. And I believe Russia's will continue to fall greater for two reasons. One, it started at a higher point. And two, Russia is a declining power. I think we're seeing that right now in the U It can't even, it, its troops can't even defeat the Ukraine. The Ukrainians are beating the crap out of them. The only thing that Russia has, quite frankly, that keeps it from being relegated to a uh, second, third rate status are nuclear arms. That's all. That, that's all. It, 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 its economy is in shambles. So that, that, that's one, one element. The decline of Russian imports and the, the second element is the growth of, a, of an Indian arm in, industry. 
we're also seeing new countries in the mix. Now, over the last 20 years, besides Russia, the United States and Israel have become India's largest um, our arms, uh, arm, arms, arms source. Now, what we've seen in the last couple of years, by the way, with the growth of the native industry, we're seeing the percentage of arms purchases from the United States has also gone down, not as great as it's gone down from Russia. Uh, I can tell you the, the, the arms that they're buying from the United States is of much better quality because, as like I said, Russia is a declining power. But the percentage, well, the percentage coming from Israel has gone up. So I think what we're seeing there is an increase in Israeli imports. And I think what we're going to see is an increase in military, you know, military arms joint ventures between Israel and India. Because I, I got to tell you, <laughs> the power, the brain power between India and Israel is incredible to calculate. So I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, India has become buy, has, has begun buying significant arms from new players in the international arms market. Uh, South Korea is one, South Africa is another. You know, it's also started buying some things from uh, some, some other countries that are really uh, uh, just new to the arms market. So I think what we're going to see over time are the following. The decline in Indian imports from Russia, an increase in India's own in arms industry, an increase in imports from Israel, more importantly, an increase in joint ventures between India and Israel. And India is starting to buy certain things from some of the smaller players in the international arms industry, especially South Korea, South Africa. And my guess is particularly South Korea is not gonna be a minor player for very long. Um, so, uh, and anyhow, that, that's, my, that's, that, that, that's my own opinion about where this will go. By the way, one other thing. I think what we'll be seeing over the next several decades, and it should be, and this is really all in India's lap to do, is a stronger, more independent India. As India continues to chart an independent course, I think we're going to see uh, an expansion of its, uh, of, of its uh, own arms industry because more people are going to buy, buy India. And again, that will be, all, all these things will help the uh, Indian economy and of course the people of India. So that's just my prediction. Yes, any more questions? Uh, we should not detain our guests for a long time. That's right. I'll stay as long as you want. That's okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I know I have, disturbed, well, your, I have disturbed your morning sleep. <laughs> you, you, sir, are never a disturbance. It yeah. always warms my heart when I yeah. interact with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, it said, uh, uh, now with your permission, uh, I would like to close this session. But before that, I would like to express my sincere uh, gratitude to you for sparing time and uh, explaining things in very detail. Uh, actually, I had been uh, looking for you uh, for some time, how I should uh, invite you to uh, speak on the matters which are of vital importance to India. So, uh, naturally, uh, you are the most uh, authentic, authoritative, and uh, I think uh, a person who has an expertise in explaining things like this. So, thank you very much. And uh, uh, with your permission, I would like to close this uh, session. One, one thing I want you to know, uh, I am anxious to do this again. I would love to do a session on yeah, yeah. Bangladesh sure, sure. And I want to, more than anything else, I want to thank you, sir, for doing this. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.